Hello and welcome to the This Works For Me Virtual Summit. I'm your host, Fermpe Watson. I am the director of the Faculty Development Center at Murray State University. Are you looking for strategies to help you develop and launch online programs? Well, our guest today, Jonathan Small, will be providing you with some strategies to do so. Jonathan, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Firm Faith. I'm glad to be here with you. Me too. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, where you're from, and what you do? Sure. So uh, I'm the Associate Vice President for Online Learning at Regis College. We are a reasonably small private institution outside of Boston, Massachusetts, uh, and that is where I'm from. I'm originally from the Boston area. Um, and I work for Regis College to help them uh, with all of their online learning programs. So we have graduate and doctoral degrees, and I work with all of the different departments to uh, launch those degrees, maintain those degrees, and all of the support services that help um, provide services to our students and faculty that are online here at Regis. Wow. That is a lot that you have just described here. So how do it you- It is a lot, yes. <laughs> how did you get involved in developing and launching online programs? Sure. Um, actually, I got involved with online learning, I would say relatively early, maybe compared to some of the folks that are watching this. Uh, I worked at a small institution in the Boston area um, doing something completely unrelated to online learning. Uh, and back in 2001, they received a grant from the Sloan Consortium, which is now the Online Learning Consortium, uh, and they were trying to help smaller schools try out online learning for the first time. Um, so I was just right place, right time. I was very interested in the work um, and started out as the e-learning program manager uh, for that school and it helped, uh, it helped me learn all about the different pieces of online learning. So we we're building courses and supporting students and training the faculty and kind of learning by doing uh, way back then. Um, and it's been my whole career since. So I've worked with a, a bunch of different universities, uh, mostly in the Boston and New England area, helping them launch their online uh, learning programs, be they certificates or degrees or whatnot. Um, and I actually also worked for the Online Learning Consortium for a little bit of time, helping them develop workshops for people like ourselves, people uh, from higher education that were interested in online learning. Um, so that was a very good experience for me for where I am today. Wow, and we're so glad that you'll be sharing some strategies with us. The, the title of your strategy is Developing and Launching Online Programs. So let's turn our attention to developing online programs. What are some things that we should consider if we'd like to do that? Sure. Um, one of the first things to consider, and it, and it sounds very simple, is really just determine the purpose, right? A lot of times folks will be interested in developing, maybe it's a faculty member or a particular dean at your institution. They have great interest in their area of study or expertise, mm -hmm. and they would like to provide that to people online. But you really need to determine the purpose as to why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. Is it that you want to showcase your expertise? Is it that your institution would like to increase their enrollment or their revenue by putting something online? Um, is it in support of the mission or the strategic plan of the institute? That was really the sort of the, the beginning of that here at Regis College. It, it met with our strategic goal of expanding mm -hmm. um, access to education, mm -hmm. and it also was of great interest to expand uh, our enrollment into different areas. So. Um, those were two of the reasons that we did it, and I think it's something that people really ought to think about before they uh, launch, try and launch an online degree or program. Mm -hmm. um, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I, are there any other things that we should be considering? Yeah, I mean, it's a great investment of both your time and energy and mm -hmm. also money to, to launch an online degree program at a university level um so you really have to make sure that it is worth pursuing um mm -hmm. because of that great investment mm -hmm. um in, in having great interest in, in a particular program does not necessarily mean that it will be uh, mm -hmm. successful 
So one of the other key things that I think people need to really consider is what is the demand for the program, right? If you build it, will they come? Does it, does it doesn't necessarily mean uh, because you launch um, one of your degree or certificate programs online that, that people actually need it. So there's some things to think about, you know, what, what is special about your program? What is your niche? Mm -hmm. um, think about why someone will go to your university over another one that maybe offers something similar. Mm -hmm. um, are there lots of competition out there? Are, are you one of hundreds and hundreds of options? Or are you something more unique? Mm -hmm. um, that's really something to, to have a deep understanding of before you go out there. Um, and then think about enrollment, right? Mm -hmm. How many students do you need to be successful uh, if you launch your online program? Will a, a handful of students be considered success at university? Is that the goal that you're trying to reach? Do you need dozens or hundreds or thousands of students for it to be successful? I think it's different at every institution, but you really have to know, you know, are there enough people interested in what we're planning to offer and how many people do we need to consider that a successful venture? Mm -hmm. um, and, and really thinking about maybe what you're offering, I guess you could call it the product. Mm -hmm. you know, are you doing uh, badges or a certificate, a whole degree? If it is a degree, are you thinking about serving undergraduate students, graduate students, uh, non-traditional learners? Um, because all of those different choices will, mm -hmm. will dictate who might be coming to your university and, and how you need to uh, plan to support that. Yeah, I, I like how you're really telling us about look at the reasons for developing the online program and all these things that we should be considering. And I, and I wonder some, sometimes about the capacity. Um, what should we be considering when we think about the capacity of building an online program for a university? Oh, for, that's a great question. Um, it's, it's helpful, I think, to start with asking some questions about, you know, where would the pressures come from? What's going to change? If, if this is new to your institution, if you hadn't offered uh, online programs before, mm -hmm. to really think about if we had uh, distance learners and faculty who might be teaching uh, from offsite, mm -hmm. how is that going to change some of the policies and procedures and the way that we operate? Um, if, if you're success requires you to have lots of students, you know, what does that mean for your institution? Will different um, offices that serve students like IT or the registrar or whatnot be able to handle an influx of students if your venture is successful? Um, so doing a needs assessment, you know, thinking about what are the systems and policies and procedures that we need in place to make this a successful venture is something that I would recommend to anyone that's trying to do this and, and really looking at not only the academic departments that are going to be involved, but the non-academic departments, like I mentioned, registrar and financial aid, the bursar's office, um, your other support services like IT, you know, just thinking how this might have a ripple effect across your university is something that you really need to figure out uh, before you even think about launching a program like that. Wow. So, Jonathan, imagine that I'm a dean mm -hmm. and I ask you to help me think about some things regarding the quality of an online program that I'd like to develop. What are some things that I should consider? Hmm. Well, yeah, that's a good question as well. Um, because you do want to make sure it's quality. I think at, here at Regis, one of our goals was to ensure that even though the modality of delivery has changed, that the quality of our programs are just as, as great as they are on campus. Um, so some of the things that, that we've worked on that I'd recommend to others is, um, first of all, establishing a course design process. Mm -hmm. um, instructional design is very important to this, making sure that you're able to take what your faculty do well in a, in a traditional classroom, and adapt to the new modality and sort of the differences of teaching. Um, so having rubrics, having a course uh, model maybe to follow so that students don't have to navigate from course to course. Um, the different things that they need to find in one course are the same across courses. And I know that can be challenging in certain institutions um, where uh, each online course is maybe more individualized by faculty member or department. But I think if you're thinking about 
a whole program, you have to think about the student experience and their navigation through it, um, as well as training the faculty, right? Because teaching online is teaching, but it's a different style of teaching and a different method of teaching and different skills might make you more successful uh, in that modality. So making sure that you've got a faculty development process alongside your course development process uh, would be important. And what are some of the rubrics that would be some good examples to use? Okay. Uh, so for example, you don't have a often face-to-face -face discussion like you would in a classroom. So maybe having something like a discussion rubric for threaded discussions that would happen in an online class, making sure students understand what would make them successful in those discussions and making sure the faculty understand how to encourage fruitful and thoughtful discussions in that online uh, discussion area. Okay, oh, so that's what you mean by a rubric. I thought you meant the rubric, like the quality matters rubric and so on. Okay, so you're No, but that's a great point. And if people aren't aware of what the quality matters rubric mm -hmm. is, that's a, a rubric for building and delivering high quality courses. It's definitely a resource I would recommend to folks um, who are thinking about teaching or building an online class. It really takes the individual faculty member and the individual subject matter out of the picture mm -hmm. and applies a rubric to online courses that is mm -hmm. um, industry accepted and, and well researched and gives you some really good guiding principles to make sure no matter what type of subject matter you might want to be teaching that you're following good practice that's just good yeah. online teaching practice. Yeah. So let's take this a little step further. What about academic integrity? I know that some people are concerned that if students are taking courses online, are they who they really say they are? What should this be considered in terms of academic integrity? You know, it's funny. I, I find this question interesting because when I started in online learning in 2001, people asked me this question. And now that it's 2019, people still ask this exact same question. Mm -hmm. You know, is online learning you know, something that you can ensure the academic integrity of? And I would say wholeheartedly, yes. You just need to think about things a little bit differently. Um, one of the first things, and, and this is required if you're um, offering financial aid, is a verification process. Mm -hmm. Who are the students that you are enrolling in your campus, right? How do you know who they are? And it's even simple things as requiring people to give you unique identifying information on their application, like their social security number, their address, et cetera, uh, and making sure that you work with your IT folks to make sure that they've got individualized accounts and secure access to your online courseware and things like that. Um, maybe things that you've already got at your institution, but something you really need to set up for an online program. But I think people are usually talking about the, the courses themselves, um, so there are a lot of tools out there available to faculty who teach online, plagiarism detection tools and other um, test monitoring tools. So you could actually have live proctoring for online exams if you need to. Our nursing uh, online program has some live proctoring like that because it's required for their, uh, some of their licensure exams that the students take. So there's lots of different tools to kind of replicate having a faculty member in the classroom while people are doing certain activities that you can do online. Um, but I'd say even more important than all of those tools is just having very intentional course design and thinking about, you know, maybe an activity that you do in a classroom is appropriate for the classroom, but other activities need to be slightly adjusted to, to reach the same teaching outcome in the online class. Um, for example, true false, exams, right? You can do a true false exam. It's very easy. It corrects itself, but it, those are something that would be easy for students to share. Mm -hmm. I think having more written assessments, more of those threaded discussions, more assessments that really require students to give thoughtful feedback in the online modality is something that really lends itself. And I always tell faculty when they're getting trained or they're new to online, you'd be very surprised how well you get to know your students if you have a well-designed and well-thought-out course with these uh, intentional activities where you kind of get to know the strengths and weaknesses of your students, you'll very easily be able to tell uh, if they're turning in work that does not feel like it's coming from them. Mm -hmm. um, so along with those tools, I, I think you, you have got a lot of ways to ensure that you've got 
high academic integrity in, in online courses and programs. Yeah, excellent, thank you. So let's sure. turn our attention now to the launching part of the online program. What are some things that we should consider when doing so? Sure. Um, when the program actually launches, when you start enrolling your first students, I think you need to plan as best you can, but be prepared for the unexpected. I think we're talking about some of the capacity things that, that folks ought to think about. Um, for example, if you thought you were gonna get 50 online students in the fall semester and you got 150, right? Do you have the staff, do you have extra faculty on hand to maybe teach an extra course or two? Um, you know, planning for that, that unknown, because uh, mm -hmm. you don't, sometimes when you start these things, you don't know how many people are actually gonna show up. Mm -hmm. um, also, data collection is, is something that I think people sometimes think about a little too late in the process. Mm -hmm. Are you able to identify online students versus other types of students in your student management system? Mm -hmm. um, a year from now, after you've launched, are you gonna be able to dig down and find data about your online students versus other groups of students, even for accreditation reports or just improving the program. Um, so thinking about those kind of things for the launch are very important because um, you might not need them when it starts, but you're going to need them a little bit later down the line. Mm -hmm. so data collection is key. Mm -hmm. um, I know that state authorization is one of those things that people you know some people are knowledgeable enough to consider it in the development stage but also mm -hmm. it's during the launching stage or even after that that some people consider what would you say to people regarding the state authorization for online program yeah i mean having been doing this for quite some time the state authorization has been something i've been working on for many years um it is something that people don't always understand until they get involved with online learning. So just for those who might not be aware, you do need to get authorization to enroll students from other states, mm -hmm. which is something that's required by the federal authorities. And it's something that is required of all institutions who enroll online students. But it might not be something that really comes top of mind to a faculty member who's really excited about their uh, area of expertise and they just want to launch that online degree. Um, mm -hmm. It's sort of that regulatory kind of boring stuff in the background um, but it is important and nc sarah is a good uh, group that has done a lot of work to make the process a little bit easier but it is ongoing and sometimes it requires resources that might not be under your control so you want to make sure you reach out to the appropriate uh, folks at your university maybe the compliance office and make sure you understand what you can do before you launch the program, because some of these things you can do before you launch the program, but for example, for licensure programs, like nursing or social work, some, some of those things you need to do after you launch your online program. Sometimes you need to provide student data to get um, certain authorizations for um, programs that maybe have an industry accreditation alongside your regular university accreditation. Um, so there's a lot of licensure authorization work that might need to happen that, you know, folks might not be aware of or might not think of before they launch an online program. And I will say, um, you know, as, as things grow, you might find that you're enrolling students in different places and you might find that you're hiring full-time and adjunct faculty who are teaching online at a distance from your university so they might be operating in different states and that can cause some work on people's uh, different offices around a university like paying payroll taxes or workman's compensation taxes or um, taxes if you're incurring revenue at a certain level in different states all of a sudden that you hadn't been operating in before so these are just some of the things that are sort of outside the teaching scope yeah. of launching an online program that really have a huge effect on, on a university across many departments that sometimes people don't realize until you've, you've launched the program and different offices around your institute are being affected. So that's, that's definitely something um, that can happen once the program actually launches. So you mentioned NC Sarah earlier. Could you help our viewers understand what is NC Sarah? 
Sure. So the SARA is S-A-R-A. So it's the State Authorization Reciprocity Act. Um, and back in 2001, when I started this, no one paid any attention to state authorization. I think it was in the 2008, 2009 timeframe, uh, the government gave guidance to schools because more schools were involved in online learning and they were enrolling students all over the place. And they said, you know, as you're enrolling students in different states, you need to get permission from those states. And part of it has to do, a large part of it has to do with consumer protection um, in case students have a grievance and, you know, with a school, they have some method to do that, even though they might be hundreds and thousands of miles away from that school. So in the beginning, an institution like we're in Massachusetts, Regis, we would have to apply to every individual state where we wish to or were enrolling online students. And that was a very cumbersome and expensive process. Mm -hmm. um, so some folks at Wesset, um, which is another group, got some people together and spent a number of years talking to regulators in different states, talking to different universities about the work that they were having to do. And they said, you know, really everyone's asking the same thing. We want to protect students. We want to make sure that schools offering distance education are doing it at some minimum level of quality. Um, and these are all good things, but we don't need universities to have to be um, navigating all of this regulation in four, up to 49 different states and U.S. territories and whatnot. Um, so NC Sarah made a compact that states could join and say, if we all agree to these sta minimum standards and your state agrees that they will become part of this compact agreement, um, then you can just apply in one place instead of having to go from state to state to state to state as your online programs go grow. So it is a lot easier than it was, a lot less cumbersome, but it's still an important regulatory process that you'd have to deal with um, if you're launching an online program for the first time. And it, and it might not be the first thing that sort of pops up on people's radar when they're thinking about you know, launching an online MBA or something like that. Well, thanks for clarifying that. Um, sure. You know, I just imagine that there are some things that you probably could advise us to avoid when we are <laughs> developing and launching online programs in general, or just some tips that we should literally think about when we're doing this in general. Yeah, I mean, we've covered a lot of ground there. I would say one thing that comes to mind, or two things that come to mind, is just make sure that, um, you know, you've got what, what our president, President Hayes here at Regis, like to say, the, the coalition of the willing. So if you would like to go down this road and launch an online program, and it's something new for your university, to really seek out other folks that are going to be supportive of that, be they the faculty. You know, if you have a group of faculty that's, um, very interested in doing this. It's good to have their buy-in from the faculty and making sure that the leadership of your institution is behind you. If you're a dean and you're interested in doing this, as you gave the example at the beginning, um, to make sure that the leadership's behind you because all these things we've been talking about, it really affects people all across your university. So you need that leadership support because um, you might be dealing with state authorization and have to call on uh, like your legal office or compliance office for help. Um, and if you don't have their support, you might not get very far. So I think just making sure once you've got the great idea that you get um, that support behind you is going to be essential. Mm -hmm. I just imagine that someone might be listening to you and they resonate with a lot of the things that you have shared today, but they might just be a bit hesitant to start an online program be it the, the marketing, the demand, because you know sometimes somebody might come up with a great idea to develop an online program but then when you start testing it and, and going out there it really doesn't work. Perhaps they have seen it with another program before. What would you, what would be your advice to someone who is a bit hesitant and don't, don't even know where to start? <laughs> yeah, well, I guess my, my initial advice would be don't, don't be afraid of trying. It is a lot of work, but just don't be afraid of trying. Um, and make sure that you're asking lots of questions. I know we've thrown out some pretty pretty heavy topics here today. We could probably spend a, a whole another uh, talk talking about one or two of these things for, yeah. for uh, 20 or 30 minutes alone. Mm -hmm. um, but really just making sure you're asking lots of questions. I think 
one of the keys that I've seen is, is that market demand, right? Mm -hmm. People get very excited about, I really want to launch whatever certificate or degree program, because this is my area of interest and I'm very interested in it, but you have to make sure that there are people out there in the world that are also interested in it because otherwise you're doing a lot of work and spending a lot of time and a lot of effort for nothing. And I think sometimes that's where people fail that even if it's your area of interest, it might not be marketable. And that, that upfront work to really decide, is this worth pursuing? You'll never have a perfect answer. But I think if you go through the process of asking these questions and being very thoughtful about Mm -hmm. why you're launching a certificate or a degree or a different online program, uh, then you can feel pretty confident that you're going to have success in it. Mm -hmm. um, so you should feel encouraged by that, but it would be dangerous to not do that upfront work and just try and see if it works because it, it might not. Mm -hmm. Wow. Jonathan. So are there any resources that you would recommend for our viewers to review? Sure. Um, a really good one for um, doing that market demand piece is actually the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Mm. So it's a government website. They have free data. You can really take a good look at what the job market is. So if you're thinking, you know, we're going to start this degree, what's our end product is graduates that are hopefully going out in the world and doing some of these things. Is the job market for those, those folks growing? Is it mm -hmm. shrinking? Is there a need out there in society for people to have this knowledge and understanding? And therefore, are there students who are probably interested in coming to learn this from your institution? That's a, a really good resource to kind of do that initial research. Mm -hmm. um, I would also utilize one of the maybe uh, the resources on your campus, like the library, because they are very good at doing all kinds of research. And they're usually very excited to have people come ask them interesting and different questions. So they could probably find you all kinds of research depending on what uh, particular subject you're looking to go out there and launch an online program for. And then for folks who are maybe new or, or even recently coming to or thinking about online learning, I would say I'd mentioned them earlier and I, uh, the online learning consortium, the OLC, mm -hmm. Um, they are a professional organization that is for higher education professionals who are learning to teach or develop courses online, um, different technologies about teaching online. They have lots of different um, types of resources for people who are interested in online learning. And I would strongly recommend someone who's curious about teaching or building a course or even launching a program, uh, look at them as well as UPCEA, which is U-P-C-E-A. Mm -hmm. um, they're another professional organization. They deal more with uh, continuing education and adult learners, non-traditional learners, um, but they also have resources for online learning. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of times when you're talking about online programs, you're talking about non-traditional learners mm -hmm. or adult learners. Um, so that might be something that's new to folks, but they have a, a lot of resources and I would say, uh, finally, myself, I'm happy to share my contact information. I've done a little bit of this work over the years, and I'm happy to always talk to any of my colleagues out there in higher ed that are interested and have questions. So, I, you know, people can feel free to reach out to me as well. Right. And I will be linking in the video description below, I will be linking to the resources that Jonathan mentioned, and his contact information will also be in there. So we could definitely check those out. Yeah. So Jonathan, thank you very much for sharing with us today. You gave us some practical advice. I know that this topic is a huge one. It is a big one, yes. Yeah. And as you said earlier, any one of the things that you mentioned, we could actually do an episode on it. But thank you for the strategies that you shared and the resources that you mentioned. And thank you for making yourself available in case other people would like to contact you to find out more. Absolutely. And thank you, Firm Faith. I appreciate the invitation to speak uh, to you today. It was a pleasure. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks so much. Great. And viewers, I would encourage you to share this episode with others. 
and continue this conversation. Tell us, how are you developing and launching an online program? You can leave a comment below the video as well and share this episode with others. And we look forward to seeing you in the next episode of this virtual summit. See you soon.